we are fortunate today to have with us to, uh, Natia Ruff, the head of the Open Source Program Office at Comcast, uh, and also the uh, chair of the Linux Foundation Board of Directors. Um, uh, Natia is going to be presenting on why your Open Source Program Office needs to invest in more than compliance. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Natia. Natia, if you have uh, any, a, a more expansive introduction you'd like to give, feel free. Otherwise, go ahead and jump in. Thank you, Aaron. Um, it's really good to be here. I will introduce myself in the presentation. Um, and it's, it's, and please feel free to ask questions along the way. Uh, we are a small enough group where it can be interactive. And uh, please feel free to um, ask questions. I'm going to bring up the presentation. Okay, can you all see the presentation? We can. Okay, wonderful. Um, I, I wanted to address the, the notion of why your OSPO or the open source program office needs to invest in more than compliance. And um, I will also talk about open source program offices in general and what they are and what their functions are, uh, why it's useful to have one, how companies uh, begin the journey of open source and you know, start investing in an open source program office. So just to introduce myself, um, Aaron mentioned two of the roles that I play today. I uh, head the open source program office for Comcast. I joined Comcast about three and a half years ago when the company uh, felt that it had reached a maturity point in open source where it needed to invest in a full-time center of excellence around open source. And I'll talk more about uh, my open source program office. And I've been uh, working with the Linux Foundation for many, many, many years. And about four years ago, I got to join the board of directors as um, a director at large, which means I represent the community and not my company. And last year I was elected chair uh, it's been uh, a, a fantastic opportunity to really work on um, the community aspects of Linux Foundation and continue to support the success that they have bringing commercial companies and open source communities together. I've spent a lot of time also using uh, my platform to work on diversity issues, uh, tech women in particular, but really creating more inclusive leadership, more inclusive companies, both at Comcast as well as in the open source community. And then working backwards to the left, um, I used to run the open source program office at Western Digital uh, SanDisk, which is a storage company, flash storage company. That was one of the first times I ran an open source program office and, and really convinced uh, my company to start one. Um, and before that, I was at Wind River Systems, which is an embedded open source and proprietary software company um, and ran the product line for the Linux, uh, embedded Linux product line. Um, and before that, it was Tripwire, a security software company uh, where I helped open source uh, Tripwire for Linux. And my journey in open source really began with Silicon Graphics in 1998. Uh, Silicon Graphics was a server company which uh, decided that uh, it was seeing the, the lighting on, writing on the wall that companies were really moving to open source on standards-based servers. And I was part of the strategy team at Silicon Graphics to move us to open source. Um, moving to open source is definitely a journey. Um, you have to start somewhere. And sometimes you get off the road and decide that you just wanna stay there. That's perfectly good for you uh, as a company and for your business. Uh, and sometimes you just continue moving forward and you can continue to stay on this journey. Uh, I don't think it ever ends because uh, there's more to do all the time. The first stage of the journey I feel is going from being dependent upon vendors uh, and using almost exclusively proprietary software uh, to moving to starting to consume open source. 
And I find that um, this was the case with Comcast. You know, we were mainly operating vendor products that we purchased and we would just stand them up. We would be highly reliant on vendors. Um, we would provide them our roadmaps. We would provide them our requirements and have to wait in line for uh, whenever they decided to work on it. And there was a tremendous amount of commercial license spend as well. And you feel uh, that you're really not uh, in charge of your own innovation. You're, you know, dependent upon whatever standard products and features vendors provide. And I'm not saying that most companies will move to a 100% open source framework, but um, you find that open source starts coming into the company in vendor solutions. I will stake my claim that most vendor solutions have some form of open source in them because a lot of key components, uh, frameworks, uh, libraries, et cetera, are very mature and good in open source, especially in infrastructure. And then you start finding that your developers are downloading open source and open source is getting more mature and more and more the stack grows uh, till, you know, best in class companies are using 50, 60, 70 percent open source in their infrastructure and in their um, product stacks. Uh, first, you know, the, the hook often is uh, it looks very attractive from a cost savings perspective. You don't have to pay commercial fees, but there is a cost of ownership involved in running open source. While you don't pay license fees, you still have to uh, provide your own support. You have to make sure that you're investing in community relations, working with the open source community, et cetera. So you find that one, this is one of the first steps that happens. You go from being 100% dependent upon vendors to start doing your own software development using open source. And it helps companies speed their innovation process. I will say that's one of the biggest drivers for us as a company to start using open source. And frankly, all of our competitors use open source. And if we don't, we fall behind. It's table stakes, you know, you, in order to stay competitive, to stay relevant, to digitize the company to move our digital uh, journey, we do need to start using open source uh, in, in our product lines. The second step that happens is when you start consuming, you clearly have to start doing compliance, right? Uh, because open source, while it's free, it's free to those who comply with the license requirements. So your legal team start getting involved. Uh, they want to help you come up with the proper usage of open source in your stacks. They want to make sure that you're not linking it incorrectly with company IP and thereby compromising company IP. Um, usually there's an emergence of uh, guidelines around licenses. Um, the company will make certain guidelines around these are okay to use. These licenses are not okay to use. And we have a, a pretty good guideline as well. We have guidelines for if you're shipping a device to customers, what kind of licenses do we allow you to use? If it's going to just be back end and in the cloud, what kinds of licenses do we allow you to use? And, and frankly, if you're consuming something from the open source, I would highly recommend that you're also checking to see that that particular project has a healthy community behind it, that there's a cadence of releases, that there are multiple people involved in contributing to the project and releasing the code, uh, that they do testing, that they have coding principles, that they have uh, a contribution guide, uh, because you don't want uh, some project that you're depending upon to suddenly go away because there was only one person that was maintaining it. So community health is something we recommend to our teams to uh, check on before they consume uh, a, a software. And you'll find that there are a lot of sites which uh, give you information on community health. It, it looks at uh, release cadence, the number of stars, the number of contributors involved, the diversity of contributors because you don't want 
all contributors to come from one single company and then that company decides to move away from that project and boom the project kind of uh, goes away. We also want to get our engineers into the habit of tracking where they downloaded the source from, what the open source license is, what the text of the open source license is, etc. Because in the end, when you start distributing these projects, you need to create a disclosure document for it. Also, for security patching purposes, etc., you want to make sure you know where you got it from, what the copyright, the uh, license is. And so you find that consumption always leads to compliance. Um, you, you have to invest in your legal team becoming much more savvy about open source and engineering uh, encouraged to track and to work with uh, legal on compliance. This is also a stage you find that uh, one or two developers in the engineering organization become part-time open source program office type of people. They act as kind of the liaison between uh, engineering and uh, legal, or they start kind of, um, uh, you know, being an expert in uh, guidelines and in open source usage, and they become kind of the go-to people for uh, questions. I, I really think most of us have very good intentions and we work hard to do compliance because it's the right thing to do. It respects open source norms, it respects the license. That's a small thing to do for the right to use it. It also helps us manage risk. Um, risk of non-compliance can result in everything from community enforcement to um, you know, litigation to public relations, um, just the reputation of the company and not being very good to also stop ship of products and hence uh, it's important to do compliance. Uh, it's a must do if you are using open source in any way. So the, the step that comes after compliance is the difficult step, right? And is where a lot of people stop and they say, this is sufficient, I'm getting the benefit of open source because I'm innovating quickly, I have open source and it's free and I'm doing my compliance, you know, I don't need to contribute because, oh my gosh, it's complex and I don't know community norms, I don't know how to contribute uh, and uh, what if I inadvertently contribute uh, IP or things that I should be patenting or keeping inside the company. So this contribution becomes a real stumbling block for many, many companies. And it takes a while before companies make the transition between uh, consumption compliance to contribution. But you find that if you are becoming more and more uh, of a user of open source, it behooves you to track your dependencies. It behooves you to know where your software is coming from, what the quality of that software is, and that dependency also then says to you, I am becoming very dependent upon this particular code of software. I better contribute or engage with that community so I know where it's going and I can work with that community to make sure that it doesn't go um, to a completely different direction than where we need it to go because our product depends upon it going a certain way. You also start seeing that teams, once they download, they may make tweaks, they may fix bugs, they may say, I need to change this to work for what we're doing. And if you keep carrying these custom tweaks forward, uh, or you fork the distribution and create your own custom uh, distribution, you find that you start accumulating technical debt. And it becomes more and more and more expensive to reconcile the main line of the project where all the innovations are happening that you want to take advantage of and your custom fork. So it becomes important to start contributing back in order to reduce the cost of maintenance, the cost of technical debt, and to make sure that the changes that you want are maintained in the main line by 
the whole community and you're not bearing the burden of all of the, uh, the forks and the changes that you made. You also start realizing that if you are so dependent upon this particular component, say you are dependent upon Kubernetes or um, say the Yocto project like we are, you find that you need to sit at the table of the project, whether it's at the advisory board or the technical committee, to make sure that your needs are being met and that your needs are being prioritized. And it is, it is, um, it is across a number of uh, different companies and different uh, community members, but you need to be at the table to articulate why the project should support what you need or why it should go in a certain way. And that's community engagement. So it can come in many, many different forms. It can come in the form of money. You can say, I want to sponsor this project or I want to give them some money so that they don't uh, go away. You want to give code back. You want to provide time. Like I sit on the advisory board for the Yocto project and uh, I evangelize the project and make sure that the project is successful. All of this is important because we are all dependent upon this commons, this open source commons. And if we don't give back, then one day it could go away. And, you know, if each of us says, hey, someone else will do it, someone else will take care of it, uh, it just doesn't happen. And so you end up uh, with something that your stack is built on one day going away. So it's important for us to sustain open source. And I think the value from open source comes uh, and increases tremendously with contribution because you are now uh, understanding the direction of that particular project. You are making sure that the project is going in the direction that you want. The maintenance of your changes are back in the project and you're not bearing the burden, you're sharing it with everybody else. You're also getting, frankly, a technical brand uh, glow from it, a positive branding, uh, a positive standing as a citizen in the community, which then has a lot of positive ripple effects as well. And really success of open source depends upon all of us, not just consuming, but contributing back to open source. Uh, and it's one of the things that I highly recommend that we do. And, and contribution will also trigger some other legal processes in the company where you set up an open source advisory council like we have, which consists of people from the patent side, from the contract side, engineering, open source, security. And we actually ask uh, all of our engineers to submit uh, a request for contribution. And we examine each contribution across multi-functions, as I mentioned, and we then uh, recommend that it be contributed back. Um, and 95% of everything that comes in front of the Open Source Advisory Council typically gets approved and typically gets contributed back. The next step after you contribute, say, bug fixes or new features to existing projects that, that are in the open source, you start realizing that there's code that you have created for your own use inside the company that may make a lot of sense to contribute to open source. And, you know, the, the inclination sometimes is to say, no, we should keep everything inside. But not everything is IP, not everything is patentable, not everything is novel, not everything is something that um, is a differentiator or something you should keep inside the company. We keep some things inside the company which are very unique and differentiate our customer experience with everybody else's. However, uh, if it's, if it's you know, common infrastructure stuff, uh, we typically um, release it to the open source. There's also other strategic advantages to releasing things that you've created. For example, you may want what you've created to become the standard in the industry for how something is done. 
and open source creates de facto standards. So by releasing it and by having the whole community use it, it starts becoming the standard way by which some problem is solved. For example, uh, Kubernetes is such a poster child for standardization. Um, it is how uh, cloud native apps get deployed in containers. And uh, Google released it many years ago, I, I think more than five years ago, and it's become standard. Everybody uses it. If you are working in cloud native, it's become a part of Amazon's services, Azure and Google, of course. Um, so it starts becoming the way things are done. You can also build ecosystems when you release your project. You can have your customers, partners, your vendors and others using uh, the way you want something to work, right? And, and to build also other extensions and components to it. You could commoditize a space. If there's a space that's dominated by um, a commercial software that you feel is creating an undue advantage, by releasing some competitive open source projects, um, you could start providing real competition uh, to that project, to that commercial software, and thereby both accelerating its innovation you know, of the commercial software, but also having options and providing options to the community. And you're sharing also your experience uh, with others, especially in areas where it's not a differentiator, it's not uh, um, you know, an IP or a trade secret uh, for the company. I think the true strategic value of open source comes when you start becoming very smart at uh, when to release your own projects and leading companies do this. Uh, Google has done this uh, extensively, even Microsoft is doing it. Uh, we've released a number of projects, even projects that are key to our uh, industry. For example, the setup box um, is built on an open source stack and we've released it to a consortia of cable companies so that every cable company can use it to create their own setup box. And our differentiation comes at the top where we add our own you know, proprietary or value added UI and things of that nature. And you also find that the content distribution network, um, which is used by us to distribute content across uh, the US, is something that we've open sourced completely. And it's at the Apache Software Foundation, and it's called the Apache Traffic Control. And we felt that um, it allows us to both standardize on a certain way of doing things, but also shares the burden of maintaining um, that software with lots of other companies who both use it and contribute to it. There's a great example that Netflix gives of how uh, when they first started doing a project, they were the sole maintainers of the project. And in a few years, they became uh, a small maintainer and the burden was shared by so many others who were using it. So that could be a great leverage point also for why you would release uh, your own project. The, the really final stage or kind of the leadership stage, and, and there's so much to do even past this, is you can start um, collaborating both inside and outside the company in a more intentional, more strategic, more effective way. And the open source program office is often set up to do this. Uh, because there's a central, um, if you will, uh, you know, uh, center of excellence with, whose whole job is to uh, help the company navigate open source, uh, to understand, you know, foundations, projects, trends in open source, uh, how to work with these various trends, how to uh, use open source at scale, how to make sure that uh, all of the entities inside the company are uh, competent and know how to use it. And contributions are you know, more intentional, more driven, 
uh, more organized, there's more thought behind how you engage with communities, how you show up at, co at conferences, uh, your branding, your recruitment of oh, people. Uh, one of the things we also find a lot of uh, new developers say is that they want to work in a company that has an open source program that helps them contribute to open source and that allows them to contribute to open source. And uh, frankly, um, Comcast, if, if, you, if you didn't know we do a tremendous amount of technology, you would think, um, you know, why would I want to join Comcast as a developer? But um, our open source branding has really helped us attract some great developers into the company because they see that we are a technical company and we do a lot of open source. So I think um, there's so much value to be had from open source, not just from consumption, but from engagement, from collaboration, from contribution. And so an open source program office helps you be more intentional about getting the best value from open source. And a lot of leading companies do this. I just wanted to stop and see if there were any questions and before I moved into uh, the, the next few slides. Okay. Um, these slides, these next few slides come from uh, a group called the To Do Group, uh, T-O-D-O -O Group. Uh, talk openly, develop openly, I think is, is uh, how it came about. And this is a group of open source program office leaders like myself. So there are hundreds of companies who have open source program office. I, I would say about 200, 250 companies. We all get together at the to-do group to exchange best practices, to work together on continuing to evolve, you know, how to do, how open source program offices function. And you find in this slide, uh, and this may be relevant to all of you and what you're doing, is that more and more companies are adopting uh, the practice of having an open source program office. Uh, clearly technology companies, uh, software companies uh, like VMware or Microsoft have open source program offices um, and telecoms like us, but what's really interesting is retail companies like Target and Office Depot, as they become more digital, as they become more virtual, and um, if you will, uh, doing more e-commerce and digitizing you know, their um, venues to market, uh, they're becoming um, definitely very open source savvy and establishing open source program offices. What was fantastic to see is financial services from 2019 to 2020, it's almost doubled um, the amount of open source program offices, such as Capital One, such as uh, you know, uh, Bloomberg, et cetera, having open source offices. Even the government is establishing open source offices, universities, governments, and healthcare, especially with uh, what's happening with COVID. Um, there are, there's a lot of interest in collaborating on common uh, healthcare projects, whether it's contact tracing or a data analysis around uh, COVID uh, spread. And the to-do group is a fantastic location, uh, todogroup.org, for uh, case studies, for information on how to start your open source program office. It's, it's a project uh, under the Linux Foundation. It's free to join if you're a member of the Linux Foundation. And we do this annual survey, which gives you lots of great information on how uh, open source program offices are, are adopted, where they're adopted, what value they provide. So it's really a good way to create a business case inside your company uh, if you want to start an open source program office. Um, where does the open source program office sit and what, it's, what is its value to a company? You find that most of the time they sit inside software engineering and development, reporting into the head of engineering 
for example, at Western Digital Sandisk, I reported into the SVP of engineering. And here at Comcast, I report into the CTO office. Um, my boss is the chief software architect for the company, and then he works for the CTO. Um, the CTO actually has two hats that he wears. He has the product engineering organization, and he also has the CTO hat. So it's actually a great uh, place to sit because I can work very, very closely as a developer advocate with all of the engineering teams uh, to make sure that they are using open source correctly. And you find that uh, most open source program offices can range, you know, as you can see here, uh, what, what was pleasantly surprising to me is that 32% of offices have at least 10 employees. These are really big, big companies like Google who have a lot of people in their open source program office. My team is six people strong and we support thousands of developers across Comcast. We also uh, provide support to our M&A organization, to our ventures organization, and other parts, other entities in Comcast, such as NBC Universal or DreamWorks or Sky. And you find that the longer that the company has uh, established an open source program office, the more valuable that program office is, which makes sense because they are uh, discovering new and more important ways that the program office can coordinate and create strategic value to the company and business value to the company. Um, we've been in practice for about four years um, and um, I find that there's a real recognition in our chief product officer and our president of engineering, uh, president of the whole technical product group on the cable uh, for what open source does. And I get a tremendous amount of support and recognition uh, from our leadership, which I think uh, really bodes to the positive um, impact of open source. Um, and and this, this is probably not a surprise to you all, but we have moved from being just a cable company and very vendor dependent to being a technology and media company. Technology fuels everything we do from how we distribute content to how we create content to uh, the internet services we provide to the apps to how customers interact with uh, us, uh, our customer support. There's a tremendous recognition for AI, machine learning, voice uh, activated, um, the use of clouds, you know, all of the things that you would think um, a digital company and a world-class digital company needs to have. We've moved to creating our own platform and apps. Uh, we lean heavily into open source and we are obsessed with customer experience, as are all of you. I know um, you have to. Uh, and COVID has accelerated our journey even further. So it's allowed us to kind of really, really focus on how do we create the best experience to customers and not have to have physical truck rolls or calling into um, the help center uh, for help, but to enable our customers to be more and more self-sufficient. And you, you're you all now familiar with this journey. Um, it was about 2006, we were, but before 2006, we were very vendor dependent and we moved, um, started consuming uh, open source between 2006 and 2011. Uh, we established our open source policy and started kind of creating a rough open source compliance uh, council, rather advisory council for contributions. My boss was one of the first ones who contributed to Apache HTTPS um, in this time frame. Uh, and soon by 2014, we had been doing a lot of contributions. Uh, the number that I'm tracking from 2013 is about 13 or 14 contributions. We were also doing things like major contributions like the Apache traffic control or the set-top box. And um, around the 2017 timeframe is when I joined Comcast. 
and we started recognizing that we wanted to be a good citizen in the open source community. We joined the Linux Foundation, the Apache Foundation, and we started, um, you know, having an external presence around open source, collaborating across the company, which is often called inner source, where uh, teams across the company reuse uh, products and projects inside the company and share code and contribute to code across the company, uh, breaking down silos. So we we think we are um, in in a pretty decent shape. We have we have more to do clearly, um, but we are in a very good position from an open source program office perspective. Um, I think many of you probably have some form of part-time open source program office, right? Uh, you know, some engineers who act as the experts, but legal is definitely involved in the first few stages. And then as you reach critical mass and as you realize that you need to be uh, more involved in open source, you start establishing an open source program office. And, and as we discussed before, the business value really uh, increases with greater and greater engagement. Um, you know how to extract the right level of value and give back um, the right level of support to the open source community. Why start, why we started? Uh, for us, it was about scale. Um, we have thousands of developers, almost um, between six and 9,000 um, technical folks in the company. We wanted them to be competent in using open source, working with open source communities. Uh, it was strategic to us for innovation. Um, we wanted to comply uh, accurately and well. Uh, we wanted to improve our technical brand from a recruitment perspective, from just, just a, a brand perspective. Um, and we wanted to create a culture of collaboration inside the company. Those were some of the reasons why we started an open source program office. And I provide this diagram to people I know. Uh, I, I always talk about my function as sixfold. Uh, communicate inside and outside the company, guide consumption, uh, guide contribution, uh, encourage collaboration, and create a culture of collaboration and comply with licenses. Those, those are really the main, main uh, charters of the Open Source Program Office. And it's so important to have an external portal or some sort of a presence and you find that all the best income class companies have this. Um, it allows the community to connect with you. Uh, for example, we get often many questions through this portal. Um, also, frankly, from a compliance perspective, you want to present an ombudsman or a face to the community so that uh, if you're not complying or if there is an issue, they have an easy way to connect with you and give you a chance to correct the issue before it becomes uh, a big issue. So here in this portal, we uh, host all of the projects that we've open sourced. We also have our statement about why we are involved in open source. We do innovation grants. We actually do contributions. So we have a portal for people to apply for a grant. Um, all our talks are featured here, and also how to contact the Open Source Program Office. Some of the metrics we use to measure the success of the office and also open source in the company, I want to measure the Open Source Program Office effectiveness. How are people adopting some of the practices we've rolled out? How mature are the different divisions in the company? Um, what business impact are we making? And I have to say business impact is harder to measure because the line of sight between open source and the actual, you know, uh, top line or bottom line is, is hard. It's, it's a long line. We also want to measure um, what are we dependent upon? Uh, which communities should we work with? Uh, how are we influencing that community? Or do we have sufficient number of people involved in those communities? 
uh, project effectiveness. If we are open sourcing something, how healthy is our project? Are we making sure we have a maintainer and that we have a readme document and a contribution guide? Do we have a diversity of contributors to our project or is it Comcast heavy? Uh, from a talent recruitment perspective, is open source one of the reasons why people are coming in? And in, even in the technical ladder, is it helping influence promotions for people? Are people saying, um, you know, is the ladder for becoming a distinguished engineer and a fellow include the fact that they need to be involved in open source or they're contributing or they sit on uh, a board in open source, etc. And I, I like to measure the engagement as well. Are we attending events? Are we blogging? Are we sponsoring? What is the perception of the company in open source? The to-do group survey, for example, will say, here is what developers think of these companies. And I look at that to see how we are perceived in the community. So as I as I can as you can imagine, um, open source in in Comcast is a key key part of our innovation. It's important to how we innovate uh, to get to market faster and to do things smarter. Um, and that's my presentation. So I'm going to stop uh, sharing and go to questions and see if there's any questions. Remember to unmute yourselves if you have a question. Uh, there's one in the chat and I'll read it out loud. What are your best tips for an organization to get their engineers more involved in open source, specifically for a company that currently has no or very little open source exposure for employees? That's a great question. Uh, one of the things we've done is we hold an open source day every year um, and we do more than one open source day and we invite external speakers. We also ask, uh, there, there always are a few enthusiasts in the company and we highlight them, we showcase them, we do a case study around uh, some, some of the successes we've had in the company and that I find really fuels the rest of the company to get more involved and they get some really bright ideas from external speakers. Uh, the speaker one is is huge. Um, the second, I would say, is working with HR and working with uh, the technical ladder to make sure that open source is a, a part of the requirement for, to move up the technical ladder. Um, and then really publicizing conferences to attend. I find that when people have attended their first open source conference, whether it's an Apache or a Linux Foundation conference, they become enthusiastic about open source. They kind of start getting uh, understanding the culture of open source. Um, so those those would be two or three ideas um, for, um, and and it's always easy to work first with those who are already converted, those who are already enthusiastic, and then um, you know to expand from there. I have a question, Atia. You mentioned that um, moving from sort of compliance to contribution uh, tends to be a, a bit of a hurdle for a lot of companies. And I'm wondering if there are, uh, if you have suggestions for overcoming that hurdle. Yeah, um, and, and a lot of it is because um, there is no established process in the company. So those who have made that change um, to uh, an open source project uh, find it daunting to go track down the right legal people, uh, get permission from their bosses, and uh, make the case for contributing it to open source. So the first one who does it always has such a challenging time building uh, the structures, if you will, and the process, if you will. And then sometimes you have to convince, uh, it's very daunting for an engineer to go in front of uh, a big legal panel of patent attorneys and contract attorneys and say, uh, I, wanna, I wanna give this away. 
and you know they're hit with why why aren't you submitting a patent you know why is this uh, supposed to be inside the company so one of the things um that my boss did when he first started it and and when comcast went from usage to this is he started socializing it you know one on one with the patent team uh, with the contracts team and um convince them that look this is not anything proprietary this is just a change to an existing project that i need to give back and that if i don't give back i will be holding this uh, forever and i will never be able to kind of continue to use the latest and greatest of that project so he did a lot of groundwork to kind of uh change the minds of our patent team and our contract team um so the first few times it's it's difficult i also one of the other things we've been doing is making sure our legal team is connected to the legal uh network inside com inside the linux foundation for example and inside um there's so many other wonderful uh legal frameworks legal open source um communities if you will that people need to connect with contact me and i'm happy to give you a list or aaron also has a great list of uh legal frameworks because i think once your legal team start talking to other legal teams and their peers in the industry they realize that this is normal this is uh the risk is low um this is the way to do it and frankly you can easily talk to one of our other open source organizations and and ask them you know how did you set it up and and kind of follow it there are blueprints for doing it um and it's pretty easy to uh, make that happen thank you that's a great answer uh so we have another question in chat um what are your recommendations for aligning ospo objectives uh with the company's change management policies standards and guidelines um could you say more about what you mean by that in, in terms of uh, how do you align the two reza the floor is yours i yeah there you go can you hear me yes yes thank you thank you yeah uh yes um this is Reza Alavi I'm work uh, working with um with pro open source practice um team one of the problems we have uh is um there are lots of uh steps and lots of work around change management policies and change management requirements with uh some of our clients so how open source office program would um align itself with these change uh, management policies without having a negative impact on what is um uh, ospo's objectives are because sometimes uh, these change management um guidelines and policies drags you out of um your your mainstream objectives and goals you've got in mind so how how because sometimes you find them in contradictory with them sometimes you find them as a barrier to objectives you've got from uh, for open source and program office and uh, it's even even i find um, change even more difficult than um, risk management uh, and risk management strategies so um i don't know if you we can have any recommendations on how we you, you can you, you, you can help clients in terms of aligning these two because we talk we talk normally a, a lot around risk and security and compliance but change is something which touches compliance risk and security uh, and it, it's it's especially when it comes to financial services is heavily regulated and change plays a really important role. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question and and I think your industry is a lot more um conscious of that than than other industries are uh, in in the media and technology industry we we have some amount of compliance and regulation but not as much as in the financial services industry for right reason maybe. Um 
I uh, we we really don't push teams to stay. Um, we really leave it up to the teams to do what's right for their organizations in terms of change, um, whether it's you know moving to the latest and greatest release or making a change in the project. Um, each team, engineering knows or product team knows what's the right level of trade-off to do in what they're working on. What we recommend, what we, what we do is to ask the right questions to say, um, you know, if you do this, then you will fall behind. Or if you do this, you will accumulate technical debt. And are you sure this is what you want to do? Can, is there a safe way to kind of do this trade-off, make the change so that you can get these other benefits? So I would say we don't push them. We um, really support the business in its objectives. And we just act as a counselor guide to them to think outside the box in terms of other benefits that they could get if they made the change. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, how did you structure your open source advisory council? Um, and then uh, what are the main concerns about contributions? And I'll editorialize here. I take that to mean, you know, what should that council be uh, looking at when they're considering a particular contribution? That's a great question. Um, one of the things that we were very, very conscious of when we created the Open Source Advisory Council was to not call it a committee or something that's a gatekeeper. We did not want to be a gatekeeper which said yay or nay, but we wanted to be a council and an advisory council. So we wanted to uh, be guardrails, be advice to developers who are coming in front of us. We wanted to reduce the intimidation factor. Um, we wanted to remove all friction in the uh, advisory council process. So I'm first talking about the process itself. So we made it dead easy. There's a form they fill. And then um, if it's very, very easy, for example, if it's just a bug fix or a documentation change, immediately gets approved online. They don't even have to go in front of a meeting. Um, and a ton of uh, projects get approved that way. But if they're making um, really content changes or feature changes, they have to go in front of uh, an actually a live meeting um, and, and justify the business case for why they feel that this should be contributed outside the company. So the, the composition is um, we have um, about three attorneys, one in, uh, from the uh, contract side, one from the IP side. We have our strategic IP team who really kind of um, manages our patent portfolio also there. They have more business people and techno technologists who have in their mind the kind of uh, patent portfolio Comcast should have both for defensive purposes and other purposes. And then we have uh, the security person, and then we have two or three uh, really big technologists in the company, fellows, distinguished engineers, and then we have a couple of people from the OSPO. And the dynamics are such that most of the questions typically come from uh, our patent attorney. And um, the question he often asks is, you know, what's the functionality? Is this something that you filed a patent for? Uh, because you can still patent something and choose to release it. So we encourage people, if, if it is patentable, to do that. And his, his, his thought process is typically, is this something that is very close to how we do things? Is this something that's, um, you know, um, important to our competitive advantage. Is this in an area that could beacon adjoining patents? Is this uh, in an area that we want to uh, keep inside the company from a patent strategy perspective? Each company has their own patent strategy. And, and so he asks a number of questions there. Um, and depending upon the answers, uh, we either say yes or no. And as I indicated, about 95% of the time, we say yes. 
there's only 5% of the time that, um, you know, we say no. And, you know, when you start this process as an engineer, you first have to get your manager's approval, which is saying the business says, this is something we do feel is okay to open source. And then the open source advisory council really is making sure that the developer is successful. So our OSPO team, for example, helps the developer put it out on GitHub correctly, uh, make sure that it has, it's been scrubbed and scanned and cleaned from a security perspective and from a proprietary perspective, that it has the right branding, that it has the right copyright and CLA and so on and so forth. So um, it's really um, set up to make the developer successful in doing it correctly. Thank you. Uh, and the last question with a minute left, um, what recommendations do you have to stop the branching and customization of open source components consumed internally within your company? And I guess I will add a sub question. Is it desirable to prevent that or uh, what other strategies uh, do you have to ensure that that is consistent with your uh, strategy? This is one of the hardest things to do, which is uh, stopping people from customizing it and not contributing it back. And so it's a very, very good question um, because most of the engineering managers are under pressure to uh, deliver products and move on to the next product and the next product. So they accumulate all of these changes and there's never enough time to package it and you know put it back into open source. So we are doing a lot of education of middle managers and engineering managers to say, hey, it's in your best interest to make sure that it's um, put back because uh, it's going to accumulate and it's going to kind of cripple you uh, both from security patching perspective, but also from a carrying perspective. And some people get it, some people don't. So this is a problem that we continue to fight. And it's, a, it's an issue that we continue to work on. Um, so I, I don't have a good answer. I, I feel that this is something that you have to constantly be on top of. I think that's a good answer. Uh, well, with that, our time is up. Uh, Natia, thank you so much for being here and sharing your experience with us. As our members are maturing their own open source program offices, I can't think of a better model for corporate open source leadership. So I'm really grateful that you took the time to present today. Thank you so much and hope you all have a great day. Thank you.